Shabbat Shalom, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Shabbat. Today is the 1st of July, 2023. <clears throat> and this is Parashah Balak, which means destroyer. And the Torah portion comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 24, 22, verse 2, through 25, verse 9. And the Haftarah, the prophetic portion, comes from Micah, chapter 5, verses 6, through chapter 6, verse 8. The Brit Chadashah of the New Covenant comes from Matthew chapter 21, verses 1 through 11, Mark chapter 11, verses 12 through 25, Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 32, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 19 through 31, 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 through 22, and Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. My name is Rabbi Quintana Fry, and before we start, I would like to open this time in prayer. Abba Father, thank you again for the privilege that we have to be in your presence, to study your word, and I ask that you see, teach us that which you would have for us to learn, and that everything that comes from my mouth will be from your Ruach HaKodesh, for your glory. In the name of Yeshua, Amen. So the first uh, topic I want to talk today is about <clears throat> what do we do with life's little interruptions? When things get thrown at us that we weren't prepared for, for the day to do. So <clears throat> as we know, it's very easy to become impatient and upset when these types of things, or maybe people get in the way of what we're trying to accomplish. And here is a good lesson for us all to learn. The angel of Adonai, as we know in this parasha, appeared on the road with the drawn sword in order to stop <clears throat> Balaam. So Balaam couldn't see the angel. The angel was invisible, in, invisible. But the donkey on which Balaam was riding could see the angel. So to avoid the angel with the drawn sword, the donkey goes from the road into the field and irritated with his, his ride... <laughs> Balaam strikes the donkey to force her back onto the road. <clears throat> a second time, the angel appeared in front of the donkey. Balaam obviously still didn't see it, but the donkey did. This time, the donkey was carrying Balaam through a narrow street between two vineyard walls. At that time, they would have the walls right uh, to protect the vineyards. They didn't have fences, and there was not much room between these walls. So to avoid the angel, the donkey pressed against one wall and crushed Balaam's foot in the process. <clears throat> Obviously, I'd be a bit irritated too, just for the fact that my foot would be crushed. That would really hurt. So irritated and in a bit of pain, Balaam strikes the donkey again. So a third time, the angel appeared in front of the donkey. This time, the way was so narrow that there was no room for the donkey to turn left or right. So the donkey simply laid down. <clears throat> Still unable to see the angel, of course, Balaam was so angry that he thrashed the poor donkey with a stick. I mean, he really beat it. So in his blindness, Balaam didn't realize that the irritating behavior of his donkey was actually saving his life. Adonai said, if she had not turned aside from me, I would surely have killed you just now and let her live. Numbers 22, verse 33. This kind of reminds me of a story I heard about back in September 11, when uh, the Twin Towers fell, and all that stuff was happening. There was a family who was going to the airport. The husband was driving his wife to the airport so she could catch a flight. On the way, they got a flat tire. So they had to change the tire, and in doing so, missed the flight. Obviously, that goes to show you we should always throw up to the airport a lot sooner than we think we should. However, they were very angry. Obviously, very upset over the fact that she had lost the flight, and uh, they ended up going back home. They didn't go to the airport to see, hey, maybe we can get on a different flight. They just went back home. And as they got home, they turned on the television, and the television was showing exactly what was happening with the Twin Towers and everything else. She, from my, if I remember correctly, would have been on the flight that crashed into the Pentagon, or the one that was crashing in the field. I don't remember which one. Anyway, she was on one of the four flights. would have been on one of the four flights. These were believers, obviously. <clears throat> and when they realized what had happened, that the Lord had spared 
uh, the wife's life. Well, of course, they were grateful and, and happy. So this is kind of one of those things where, hey, maybe something might seem bad to be happening when we're on the way somewhere, but Hashem is actually saving a person's life. So life is full of irritating obstacles that get in the way of our plans, as we know. Throughout any given day, a person may be experiencing countless distractions and complications. And so it's easy to become very impatient and upset with the things and people that we would say get in the way of what we're trying to accomplish. So we need to learn a lesson from Balaam. <clears throat> uh, those irritating obstacles might be from Adonai himself. Maybe, maybe not. But I'd like to say that they are. The Shem may have other plans for us, or he's trying to save our life or something. Rather than get upset when our plans are derailed, we need to seek Adonai's direction. Maybe say, hey, what's going on? What would you like me to do instead? Or what's going on? Are you trying to stop me from dying? Who knows? It's, it's good to ask. So in Balaam's life, Hashem was in the midst of all the interruptions. <clears throat> the next time, like I said, our car breaks down or the flight's canceled or some other unforeseen interruption comes up rather than get irritated, let's rem remember the story of Balaam. Um, I also remember reading the book of uh, by Merlin Carruthers called Prison of Praise, and then it describes uh, many, a, a time when um, he's be, basically the author is learning all about praising God, praising Hashem for all things. And Hashem's basically teaching him a lesson to let him know, hey, I am in charge of everything. I am in control of everything. He comes to a red stoplight. It was yellow, and he was hoping he could get through, but it turned red, so he had to stop. <clears throat> he was getting irritated, a little upset that the light had changed red, and he didn't make it. But as he's sitting there, the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, is telling him, hey, I want you to know something. I am in control of everything, even the stoplights. If we think about it, there's not one thing on this planet that is not under the control of our great and mighty God. <clears throat> so, in this book, the Holy Spirit tells him, hey, I'm in control even of the stoplights. I want you to praise me. And as he's praising him, there's a guy crossing the street in front of him. He says, you see that guy? I need you to pray for him. He didn't know what about, what for, but the Holy Spirit told him, I need you to pray for this guy. Who knows? Maybe the guy was going to go commit suicide, or maybe he just lost his job, or something bad had happened, facing a sickness. So he prayed for him. So we got to remember, every little detail in our life is under control of Hashem. It's just not happening. It's under control of him. He is in control of all of it. Might seem strange. Sometimes some really bad things happen in our lives, right? But He's in control. People of faith sometimes speak of Hashem opening and closing doors. This is kind of an idiom that refers to Hashem's divine direction in our lives. For example, suppose a certain person set out to take a job in a certain field. They really think it's what they want. Submit an application for the position, which was the person was fully qualified. And this person may be confident the job is theirs. Inexplicably, the person doesn't get the position. And they're like, what's going on? So a person like Balaam would become bitter over the disappointment. But a person person of faith would need to say, Hashem closed that door. He knows what's best. I will look somewhere else. <clears throat> Sometimes we find something even better than what we think. Or it might not be what we were hoping for, but it is what Hashem knows we need. He might not give us a job where we're like our boss. But it's something he wants to put us in for that moment to see or to teach us something or to reach out into the life of that very person we don't like. You never know. So in seeking direction in life, a person needs to keep an eye on the donkey to see what Hashem might be saying. The second thing I'd like to talk about is the plot against Israel. So in this in this part of show, we know there's a plot, right, <clears throat> against Israel. Balak wants to curse Israel. Balaam found he couldn't curse Israel. He's a guy sent by Balak to curse Israel, the so-called prophet. So even though he couldn't curse Israel, he had some other tricks up his sleeve. So even today, the people of Hashem must be aware of Balaam's fiendish, horrible plot against Israel. 
And I'm seeing a lot of so-called believers, so-called Christians or whatever you want to call them, who speak blatantly against Israel. We remind people that those who curse Israel will be cursed. Those who bless Israel will be blessed. What was said thousands of years ago still is valid today because as we know, Hashem, God, is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that's what's said in the Bible, both in the Tanakh of the Old Testament and the Brit Chadashah, the New Covenant. It's said in both sides of the story. <clears throat> So Balaam failed to curse Israel. But yet worse, he failed to win a large reward from Balak, right? So I, th I thought it kind of comes to him. He says, perhaps he could not curse Israel, but he could induce Israel to curse themselves. That's just as bad. In Numbers 31, 16, we learned that he conspired with the Midianite and the Moabite leaders and suggested a plan. He counseled them not to march out to make war against Israel. Instead, he he advised them to invite the men of Israel to a party hosted by the daughters of the Midianites and Moabites. He told them to use their daughters as bait in order to, order to lure the Israelite men to an idolatrous feast. <coughs> so when Israel uh, remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab in Numbers 25.1. So even uh, the noble women of Midian participated in the plan, in the plan to prostitute themselves to Israel. <clears throat> For example, the infamous Cosby was the daughter of Zur, one of the five princes of Midian. So when Moses saw the women of Midian, he declared, Behold, these cursed, these caused the sons of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against Adonai in the matter of Peor. So a plague was among the congregation of Adonai. This is number 3116. So the daughters of Moab invited the people to sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal of Peor. Numbers 25, verses 2 and 3. The choice of words intentionally evokes sexuality. A theme that the prophet, <coughs> excuse me, Hosea picks up in his rebuke regarding Israelite fertility cult. <coughs> so they came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame. And they become as detestable as that which they uh, <clears throat> as that which they loved in Hosea 9:10. Balaam's evil plan succeeded. He managed to deceive the nation into bringing a curse down on its own head. Adonai let loose a plague among the tribes, and 24,000 people died. <clears throat> That's a lot. So in the book of Revelation, Yeshua rebuked the assembly of Pergamum for eating food sacrificed to idols and engaging in sexual immorality under influence of the teaching of the Nicolaitans in Revelation 2.15. Remember, in the book of Acts, uh, the Jews were talking about what to do with the Gentile believers. What do we do with these guys? Do they need to follow the law like we do? And they came up with the idea, no, they can eat whatever they want, meat-wise, but they cannot eat <coughs> meat or food in general, offered to idols or the gods. They cannot eat blood, which I've seen people do, even in modern days, so-called Christians eating almost raw meat. So they cannot eat blood, food sacrificed to idols, meat uh, that was from strangled animals, and they were to remain sexually moral, sexually pure. These were the things that were outlined. So here we are, the book of Revelation, talking about the church at Pergamum. And I could say this goes into the church in the United States and other countries, where there's a lot of sexual immorality going on, even in so-called uh, different denominations. A lot going on. So... It says in Revelation 2, 14 and 15, but I have a few things against you because you have there are some who hold the teaching of Balaam, who kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block for, before the sons of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and commit acts of immorality. So you have some who in the same way hold the teaching of the Nicolaitans. <clears throat> the sexual allure and inheritance inherent idolatry of the heathen world still continues to 
entice believers and draw people away from singular devotion to Adonai. To break free from the spell of sensuality and materialism really takes a radical resolution on the part of the a believer. And <clears throat> nothing can be done without the help and the strength of Yeshua. We also need to just pray, please save me from this. I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope this is uh, reached into your heart for those who need to hear it. I know <clears throat> we all need constant uh, refreshing in our minds of things that we can all fall into. We can all fall into these types of things. So it's easy for any believer to have done these things. So the important thing is to get on our knees, repent, ask for forgiveness, turn away from these things if we are in it, and to continue. God is a God of restoration. I deny is a God of restoration. He's not here to hold our sins against those who believe, but he wants us to turn from them. Each, each and every type of sin. So for this to be in the book of Revelation means there's many churches out there, many congregations out there. It doesn't matter the denomination where all of this is happening. It's easy to point the finger. Right? I see a lot of finger pointing towards Catholic priests who did this and that. Well, for one thing, not getting married is not a natural thing. They can lead people to sin, as we've seen. But it's happened even amongst <clears throat> other leaders in the body of Yeshua, no matter what the denomination. Married or not, people in the congregation, whether they're leaders or just the people in the congregation, there's a lot of it going on. So the important thing is to not point our fingers at others, but to say, wow, this could happen to me too. And stay alert and prayerful. And if we do see somebody doing it, go to them and gently say, hey, this is what the Bible says about this. This is what was written in the book of Acts. And this is what was written in the book of Revelation. Look what happened to the people of Israel. Right? In the book of Numbers. When Balaam enticed uh, the Moabites and Midianites to lure them into sexual sin. Or it might be sexual. It might be something or having to do with idols. Who knows? Whatever's going on. But <clears throat> bring it up. Don't let them keep going in their sin. Bring it up. If they want to continue afterwards, then you do the biblical way of one person, then two people, and then three people, then out. Uh, that's what we have to do. But it's got to be done. It needs to be done. In the name of Yeshua. Thank you. And please check out our links below in the <clears throat> uh, below the video. And uh, check out our links for our free Messianic resources, our contact link, uh, the link for the Machatse Shul Tikva, which is uh, the <clears throat> website that uh, Rabbi Tim Gabriela has for biblical based counseling, both in English and Italian. We have the link for um, those who would like to support us. So, Please check that out. We have a website. Obviously, if you click on one of those website links, it'll take you to one of those pages. But there are many pages on there. You can check things out. We hope you enjoy uh, what we have. And if there's anything you'd like to see on a website that we don't have, please let us know. Uh, it was done from our heart with simplicity. But obviously, there's always something we can learn, too, that maybe <laughs> somebody would like to see on our website. Shabbat shalom to all of you. Thank <laughs> you.